Good afternoon, friends. Hope you are well. David Old here from St. John's Handling Cathedral in Parramatta. And yet again, not in Parramatta, back at home. The workmen have gone, not quite as noisy as last week. And we are about to continue our uh, study in 1 Peter. And uh, in particular, we are at 1 Peter chapter 3. And at verse 18, we're about to hit a very, very fascinating little section uh, uh, and a tricky one, actually. I want to say uh, quite tricky just to unravel uh, some of the threads of what is uh, of what's going on here. Um, it is um, a notoriously difficult little passage, a famous passage uh, of which much uh, has been made. And uh, I want to uh, just dive into it with you this afternoon. Um, as we do that, why don't I pray for us as we begin our time together? Is it one o'clock? It is. I might just uh, pray for us that God would give us uh, help. Um, all of us as we're reading this together, then read the passage and uh, we'll have a little crack into working out what's um, going on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, the Bible. Thank you that it shows us uh, who Jesus is and what it means to follow him, all the wonderful benefits he has brought to us and therefore what faith in him uh, looks like. Particularly help us, Father, um, as we read First Peter and we grapple with the situation that Peter is describing where we may be struggling, suffering for following Jesus. Uh, please give us insight this afternoon, particularly in this very, very difficult passage. Please help me uh, to explain clearly uh, to the best of my ability. We pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to those of you joining us uh, as we crack in here. We're in 1 Peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 18. Now, just before I read, let's just remind ourselves our uh, context. Uh, let's work out the context before we read because that will help frame what we are actually looking at. So, First Peter, remember, written to um, Christians in uh, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, as though they are the Old Testament saints in the exile, in the dispersion, and written to encourage them, uh, even though they suffer for following Jesus, written to encourage them to keep on doing that. And the main focus of encouragement is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it guarantees. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, our future is secure, says Peter, uh, and we hang on to that. So, of course... Uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us, he has called us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So this this uh, focus on what is yet to come as opposed to the situation we're in now. Uh, key verse, I think, 1 Peter 5 verse 10, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So there's this constant movement we've seen throughout the letters, we've worked through it week by week, that there will be suffering now, particularly as we seek to be uh, faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ in how we live uh, and in what we say. Uh, and there will be suffering that arises uh, from that. Uh, and yet there is glory yet to come. The great mistake of the Christian life is to seek glory now. Uh, and to avoid uh, suffering and not to see that suffering may be um, a consequent part of um, of the Christian life. In fact, remember that on a number of occasions, uh, Peter has written, to this you were called. Uh, and so we understand that uh, if I'm a Christian at some point, uh, I should be expecting to suffer uh, for Jesus uh, and Jesus has gone before me in that regard. Uh, the immediate context in chapter 3 is, um, well let's pick it up at verse 13, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled but in your hearts honour Christ the Lord as holy or set the Jesus Christ apart. Again uh, the same things coming coursing through ultimately says Peter who is going to harm you uh, ultimately into eternity you are absolutely lock safe um, and so we don't fear what other people fear and it's it's the fear isn't it it's the fear of what someone may do to me uh, that is so often uh, the thing that will cause me to buckle well Peter says don't fear but actually honor Christ as Lord set apart Christ as Lord recognize him for who he is and all that he's done for us and will do for us and that is the antidote now we get into this tricky 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 um, section. So I'm going to read from verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which, 
he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison uh, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, being brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. So uh, the absolute uh, uh, cracker verse is, uh, is verse 19, the spirits from prison. What, who are they? What are they? What does it mean that Christ uh, proclaims to them? And then what's going on with this baptism uh, and the corresponding and, and Noah? So there's a whole bunch of different things all wrapped up together and Peter has woven a couple of ideas together. Um, what I want to do is just, just gently pr uh, uh, prize them apart and try and work out at each stage uh, what is going on to the best of our ability. There is a little bit of tricky Greek uh, uh, going on here. And, and uh, as, as a preacher, as a teacher, I don't want to ever give the sense that without knowledge of the original language, you can't understand the text. But what I will do is just point out a couple of things uh, that are going on here, which is really important for us uh, to pay attention to as we uh, work it all out. Now, uh, what is going on? Well, uh, a traditional interpretation, and I use that word, I think it's more than a reading, it's an interpretation, it's a reading into, of, of verse 19, that Christ proclaimed to the spirits in prison, is, is the medieval doctrine of what's known as the harrowing of hell. That Christ, uh, when he was crucified, went to Hades, went to the place of the dead, a uh, very biblical thought. Uh, we've been thinking about that on our Sunday morning um, uh, sermon series at the moment. So Christ, uh, he, he dies on the cross and he goes to Hades, goes this medieval interpretation. And in Hades, he preaches to, um, well, whoever these spirits are, we'll work out in a minute who they are. Uh, it's like almost like a second chance. He declares the gospel to them again, gives them another chance and, and, and um, empties hell. Uh, um, brings them out uh, with him. Uh, it's, uh, if you look up in your own time, the harrowing of hell, um, uh, there were some great graphics of, of Jesus uh, in his resurrection, uh, bringing them out and so on. That's not, that's not quite what's going on here. Uh, let's instead uh, uh, um, have a little think about it. First of all, who are they? Whoever these spirits in prison are, they are the ones who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. So they are, they're some form of disobedience in the days of Noah. Uh, and they're spirits, and they're in some form of prison. Now, um, come back with me to uh, Genesis 6, because we'll, we'll look at, here's my best guess at who, 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 who they are. So, Genesis 6, verse 1. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. That is, that's a soft way of, of saying it, right? The sons of God there, are, that's, that's, that's another way of speaking about angels. Uh, so spiritual created beings. And some of them, uh, not all angels in the Bible are good, right? Uh, some of them are fallen and some of them, it seems, uh, looked at women and took, took women uh, to be their wives. Uh, that's a nice way, uh, perhaps, of putting it. Um, and the result of that, verse 4, is that the Nephilim were on the earth uh, in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. So uh, angels, fallen angels copulating with women um, produced the Nephilim. The Nephilim in the Bible, as you keep going, they are these gigantic uh, giant figures. Um, and you see them cropping up all the time. One of the places you see them is when the spies are about um, to enter into the land uh, after the exodus to scout out the land and they go in and they say, ah, oh, it's great, everything's huge uh, and brilliant, the grapes are enormous and so on, but the Nephilim live there, these giants are there and we cannot, we cannot defeat them. And of course, Joshua and Caleb say, it's, sure, they're big, but God is bigger. Uh, um, you're a famous Nephilim in the Bible, there's Goliath of Gath is one great famous uh, Nephilim and so on. Now, the point is, they, uh, there is, a, there is um, a model of disobedience. In fact, almost the epitome of disobedience. This is the moment, of course, uh, when Genesis 6 verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, every intention of the heart, of the thought of his heart, only evil all the time or continually. And so almost as these fallen angels come down and take women and the Nephilim are born, we get to the moment of the greatest evil that we've seen on earth. This is, this is almost the greatest uh, moment of opposition to God and to his purposes. 
And it seems, I think Peter is saying, and I'll back it up in a minute uh, um, from to Peter, it seems he's saying that those fallen angels were, uh, were punished for it. In fact, if you come with me just over to, uh, to, to Peter, um, you will see that actually he, he says just that. So 2 Peter uh, verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into... Now, the word here is not hell, uh, as English translators have it, but Tartarus, which is kind of uh, a word for a place of um, imprisonment, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Okay, uh, 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 and so um, Peter's argument there is if God didn't spare them, but actually kept them for judgment, uh, don't think that you too also will be spared from judgment. Now, so there's Peter's theology of these fallen angels. Uh, they take the, 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 the women for themselves, but God does not spare them. He keeps them in prison, this place called Tartarus, uh, until the day of judgment. Now, it is to those spirits, those fallen angels, that Jesus then, what's, where is it, um, it verse 19, he goes and proclaims. Now, some translations have the word preach, but actually it's, it's a blander word than that. It, it's, the word is simply uh, makes a declaration, uh, makes an announcement, uh, makes an announcement uh, to them. Now, what would that announcement be? Well, some have suggested it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another uh, um, uh, attempt at the gospel. Uh, but actually, I don't think that fits in with what Peter is saying here. Rather, what he's doing, of course, is he's showing us the victorious Jesus as Lord who is more powerful than any opposition that we might face. Remember, that's the context of what's going on here. He's saying, do not fear them. Who is going to harm you? Instead, set apart Christ as Lord. Well, what Peter is doing here is he's showing us Christ as Lord. And Christ, in this declaration to these spirits in prison, is declaring his victory. The victory of the resurrection and the ascension. Now, I hope that makes sense. The second question you've got to ask is, well, in what manner does Christ do this? When, when and where is it happening? And again, typically the medieval idea has been that Christ in his descent, in his descensus, uh, uh, the theologians will speak of, he makes his declaration there in, in Hades, in the place of the dead. But that's not actually what Peter says, is it? So look, again, let's just read it carefully. He speaks about Christ, verse 18, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit in which or by which he then went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So Peter's argument is not that it's in the being put to death that Jesus makes the proclamation, but actually it's in his being made alive. It's in his resurrection and ascension movement in which this declaration is made. Now, that kind of makes sense from what we know about how in the ancient world they thought about these things and particularly thought about the spiritual world. Uh, in between the Old and the New Testament, we've got a number of books that are, are what we call apocryphal. Uh, they're not scripture, but they are written by the people of God, and, so, and they're interesting just to read, uh, if only just to see what's going on. One of them is a book called The Testament of Levi. And in The Testament of Levi, uh, there is this fascinating little um, account where we're told that um, fallen angels and other spiritual creatures whom God is holding in judgment are held in the air, not, um, not under the ground, as is the kind of traditional medieval way we think about it, but actually they're held in the air. However that is, um, who knows? Again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture language more than anything else. But it is, it is kind of the way, actually, if you think about it, the New Testament does speak about things. So for example, uh, the Apostle Paul, when he speaks about Satan, will call him the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Which is interesting. So, so the, this this notion of of Satan somehow in the underworld and all these you know bad demons and danger there. It, again, it's it's not a biblical notion. It's it's a medieval notion. It relies a lot more on Greek mythology than anything in the Bible. No, instead that the Bible's cosmology kind of has Satan and his fallen angels kind of there. And then all of a sudden it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? What Peter is saying here. He's saying that as Jesus was raised powerfully in the spirit, he makes some form of declaration a proclamation to those spirits in prison and in the context it must be a declaration of victory because this is what Peter is showing us isn't it he's showing us that Jesus is far more powerful than even them and he picks the moment of greater spiritual opposition to God and his purposes those fallen angels who produce the Nephilim even they Jesus in his ascension goes boy got you 
you're defeated. It's that kind of, it's got that kind of, that kind of feel to it. And so you, what you can actually see is going on here is a statement of great confidence for the Christian. Christ proclaims to even those spirits his victory. Now, that's not enough for Peter because he actually wants to riff on some more. And he wants to show me that um, in this great battle, I am, I am okay because I'm actually with Jesus. I'm on that side. Because again, remember, what's the point he's saying? They can't harm you. Set apart Christ as Lord. That's your safety. Set apart Christ as Lord. He is your hope. You hang on to him. His resurrection and ascension is the thing that you can rely on. So look how he does it now. So having mentioned Noah, he then riffs on that. Okay. So he says, um, speaking of Noah, let me tell you about Noah. Picking it up in verse 20. While the ark was being prepared, God's waiting in patiently in the days of Noah. And in the ark, eight persons were brought safely through water. So the water, of course, is the water of the flood, which should have destroyed everybody. But eight persons, Noah, his wife, his three sons and their three wives, brought safely through, through the water. It's not the water that made them safe. They were made safe despite the water. It's almost like he you know, went through it and kept them and kept them safe. Now, with me so far? Okay, so it's a picture of safety uh, despite the, the judgment of, not least, these, these evil people all around uh, Noah. Now, verse 21 gets really funky, right? Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right, we need to really just slow down and break this down. Now, this is where the Greek kind of, you do have to talk about it. Now, the NIV has um, baptism, has, has, has the corresponding baptism, which corresponds to this water, right? But the Greek doesn't have it. The Greek simply says, this thing, this thing that I've just described, baptism corresponds to it. It's not the water that Peter is concerned about. I've seen baptism, whatever that means for a minute, hold that too, as being related to. It, it's the whole God saving people in the ark. That corresponds to baptism. Now, the baptism thing itself is, baptism is a word that's used in the New Testament in a variety of ways. We, of course, we hear the word baptism and we think instinctively of that, that water ritual, which, of course, the word can be used in that sense. But actually, it's got a wider sense of being included in, of being united to, of being joined in with, okay? And so, uh, um, the Apostle Paul, right, we are baptized into Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. That is to say, we are included in with him. Now, the marker of that, the sign of that, is also the ritual that we call baptism. But there is, a, there is a wider sense of baptism, which is simply just to be included in with somebody else. So the Apostle Paul will write, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the entire nation of Israel was baptized into Moses. That is, they were included in him. Whatever happened to Moses happened to them. And that's the point that's going on here now. We were baptized into Christ, included with him. In the same, and, and whatever happens to him happens to us in the same way that the eight people were baptized into Noah in the ark, right? So they're, they're, they're with Noah. Whatever happens to Noah in the ark happens to them. And so they are taken safely through the water of the flood and out the other side. And Peter says, well, that, that's, a, that's a picture that corresponds to baptism, your union with Christ in which you are taken with him And kept safe. And actually, what is it ultimately that you're baptized into, he says, into his resurrection, into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it brings with it this benefit, doesn't it? It's, it doesn't itself uh, remove dirt, but actually it, it makes this appeal to God for a good conscience. That is to say that if I'm included in Christ, I have this appeal to God that, that, that my conscience is clear despite my sinfulness, right? It's another way of saying you're saved by Jesus. You're safe because he does things on your behalf. So let's summarize. What is Peter doing here? Well, he wants me to be confident in Jesus. Okay. Having already said to me, don't fear them. Don't fear, don't fear them. But it set apart Christ as Lord. He wants me to see that I can trust Jesus even in the face of the greatest opposition that there can be. And it's hard to think of any greater opposition than angels themselves um, falling away and producing the Nephilim. 
okay? And so what he does is he says to me, right, here's what you need to understand. In the same way that Noah and his family were kept safe in the ark, if you were with Noah, you were safe, all eight of you, through the judgment and out the other side, in the same way, we are included in Jesus. That is to say, we are baptized into him. That's what the word essentially means. And we are, we then are saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul puts it, we're baptized into his death and his resurrection. So this, this down and then up again movement, this, this, this notion of what it means to follow Jesus, uh, suffer now, glory later, uh, is something that we're included in as we follow Jesus too. We suffer now, but there is glory yet to come. And he shows us that in the life of Jesus. He suffered on our behalf. So you get that verse 18. He suffered once for our sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's where we get made righteous. That's where our pledge of a good conscience comes from. And then he's raised powerfully. But look how he says it. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, verses 21 and 22, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been all subjected to him. So there's the great, the ascension of Jesus is the great declaration of his victory. And Peter says, Christian, you are included in that. You are included in that. On the way up, as it were, Jesus makes this great declaration of victory to these spiritual forces that oppose him. He, 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 he ascends past them, as it were, and says, Wee, I, I got you. I got it. I'm sword, I've sorted it all out. I've, I've won. And he says to us as Christians, you win with me. Your victory is as assured as my victory. That's what's going on here. That's the purpose of Peter doing this quite complex stuff here, because he wants us to fully grasp the confidence that we can have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, who is there to harm you, verse 13, if you are zealous for what is good? You can't be harmed, Christian, okay? You, it doesn't matter what they try and do to you. You cannot be harmed. How do you know you cannot be harmed? Because Jesus suffered for you in the way that you may be suffering now. And he was raised victorious, not just raised, but ascended to heaven and is at the right hand of God. The right hand, of course, is the, is the place of power. He's there in the powerful right hand of God with all angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. So you're on the winning team. So you don't need to, you don't need to fear when there are others who will seek to make you suffer for following Jesus. Instead, all that Peter says is, here's what you do. You set apart Christ as Lord. In your heart, honor him as holy, he says. You just remember who he is and what he's achieved and watch him, as it were, in his ascension, declare that victory against the greatest spiritual forces that have ever been arrayed against him. He defeated them, Christian. He's victorious over them. So you don't need to worry. Now, what is the, what is, what is the call on this? Well, look at chapter 4, verse 1. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh arm yourself with the same way of thinking and, and on he goes right so he's going to now going to say this now means i can radically think differently about my about, about my own life it, it, it calls me to live in a in a godly way not to give way to my own passions and so forth because i know where this is all going so that's the big thing today even if you're a little bit hazy on some of how this, these details work out even if you're a little bit freaked out by some of the complicated language uh get your head around this 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 big main point that Peter is making. Jesus Christ in his resurrection and ascension was victorious. Yes, he suffered first, as you may be suffering now. But if you are included in his suffering, baptized into him, he says, then you're also included in the effects of the resurrection, his great victory over those spiritual powers of darkness. Who is going to harm you? If you are eager to do good, simply set apart Christ as Lord and sit him to see him as such. So here's, the, here's the, I think, the first application today. Have you thought long and hard about the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus? Have you thought about what that means? Have you thought about what it means to that Jesus is, in a sense, crowned as king of the universe, uh, even now, waiting to come back and receive his inheritance, uh, the, the new creation uh, that, that he will bring about? Have you thought about those things? Have you considered them? Is that your sense of what reality is? Are, are you clear who wins? In fact, are you clear? I almost want to say, are you clear who has already won? Because, because that's what Peter is saying here. Are you clear that ultimately they cannot harm you if you are included in Christ? Are, are, are you clear on that? 
And are you clear that Jesus in his death, in his suffering, has brought righteousness for you, has brought what Peter later on will call the appeal to God of a good conscience? All right, that there's, it's not just an external thing like water washing off dirt on the outside, that internally something has changed. Your conscience is, is good, not because you yourself are good, but because the Lord Jesus Christ suffered for you, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God so that we can stand in front of God with a clear conscience because of what he has done. Are you clear on all those things, Christian? Because if you are, then you will not fear when possibly you end up having to suffer for following Jesus. You won't fear because you'll know you're on the winning side. Look at him, think about him, get clear on your head. Jesus is victorious. There is nobody that can defeat him. He is now at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers subject to him. If you're on his side, you're on the winning side, even though right now it may be hard to follow him and you may suffer for it. Well, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, I've now got two videos that I need to splice uh, up together uh, and I'll be getting on with that and we'll put uh, we'll upload a complete version of the video onto um, our Facebook page and the church website if you've got any questions uh, about these things please do feel free to contact us through um, through our Facebook page directly on our website you can always email me and contact me in various ways on uh, social media um, as well we love to be thinking more about these these fascinating uh, things that are going on we've been um, thinking through an eschatology series on our Sundays Sunday mornings uh, this last Sunday we looked at the question of what actually happens when Jesus returns um, and also uh, as a consequence we had a little think about what actually happens to me when I die uh, all, all those sorts of things um, if you want to kind of just get your head up around that perhaps replace a Greek influenced medieval weird um, cosmology uh, with a biblical one that might be a really good place to start uh, and I think uh, it's been interesting that this week's little video has sat alongside that I think uh, very well and they complement one another in terms of the things uh, that they're looking at uh, so dig into that uh, never any harm in digging more and more into finding out what the Bible says about these things but most of all be clear in your head Jesus has won raised and ascended victorious over every spiritual force in opposition to him so who is going to harm us if we are eager to live for him. See you all next week. Bye.